So, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we've been studying three of these authors of, in of treatises on insolubles. Uh, Paul of Venice we started with because he talks about so many, discusses 15 different, 15 other theories from, from other people before he gets around to his own, which led us back uh, to Dumbleton is one of the ones he discusses. And then the one he spends most time of is, in fact, Walter Seagray's ins Insolubles. Um, so we thought this definitely needs some investigation. So here's some preliminary results from our edition uh, of Walter Seagrove's Insolubles. So, uh, in a moment, I'm not advancing. Okay, is that okay? Can you see slide two now? Yeah. Yeah, yep. good. Okay, so uh, according to Emden's uh, Oxford catalog, uh, Walter de Seagrave or de Sexgrave was, a, was a, a fellow of Merton from 1321 until at least 1338, had his Master of Arts by 1336. Uh, I was then trying to find out a bit more about this, you know, Seagrave's background. I assume he's part of this Norman family called Seagrave. Uh, who take their name from a village right in the middle of England. So presumably it's not named after the sea, uh, but in fact it's recorded in, first recorded in the Doomsday Book in 1086, meaning something like a fold or a pool by a ditch. Uh, the Doomsday Book being uh, the big catalogue in which the Norman conquerors uh, made a long list of everything they'd obtained by conquering England. Uh, and there's a Baron Seagrave in the 13th century who dies in 1295. There's a Gilbert who's Bishop of London at the beginning of the 14th century. And then Walter, if he's from the same family, comes to Oxford um, and is there for perhaps 20 years. Um, he joins Richard de Berry's circle that I mentioned a couple of days ago, uh, who gathered uh, these... Um, figures around him like Burley and Bravardine and Kilbington that we'll meet later today. And uh, subsequently Seagrave became Dean of Titchester, but he seems to be another of the casualties of the Black Death at the end of the 1340s. Uh, the Insolubles is Seagrave's only known work, at least, at least to, to us. Um, and it seems to have been composed at Oxford in the late 20s or early 30s which is consistent with the fact that it's clearly a response to Bradwardine's Insolubles, which was from the early 20s. Uh, and he's also aware of Kilvington's Sophismata, which seems to have been composed in the mid 1320s. Uh, as I mentioned the other day, uh, as I see it, the dominant theory before Bradwardine was restrictivism, and that a part can't supposit for the whole, at least in the presence of a private term, uh, which Bradwardine spends two and a half chapters attacking, uh, particularly in the form given it by Walter Burley. Uh, so first, I think it's worth looking back at Burley's insolubles. So a cursory glance at Burley's insolubles might, might make you think that Burley rejects restrictivism along with cassationism, which you've heard mentioned several times over the last couple of days. Um, that the cassationists are those uh, who say that anyone uttering or purporting to utter an insoluble says nothing at all, since if they did, they would say something true or false, but if that, then it would be both, and so a contradiction, so it's impossible. Um, cassationists are dismissed pretty, out of hand, pretty much out of hand by Burley as denying the senses, because Burley says you only have to listen to Socrates uttering Socrates says a falsehood, to hear that he did say something. And then he seems to say much the same thing in the blunt rejection of restrictivism by observing that if Socrates starts to speak by saying something is said by Socrates, he's clearly said something true, and the only thing he said was something is said by Socrates, so something must supposit for the whole of which it's part. But of course, that's to reject unqualified restrictivism, and Burley's solution is, is in fact a qualified version of the same thing, as he says here in a quote, quotation, um, you, don't, you don't need the handout, uh, which really just matches up the quotes I'm going to give you with the Latin text, 
for those who want them. But I, I think um, Darren is is or has uh, shared my handout in the in the chat box for those who would like to match up and check and check the Latin, uh, which is always worth doing when you're looking at something I've translated, even even perhaps dare I say it with Bar with Barbara's help. Uh, there's still puzzles over whether we've actually captured things correctly. Uh, but this is my own, shouldn't blame Barbara for this one, this is my own translation of Burley. Moreover, one should realize that a part never supposes for the whole or which it's part. When putting the whole in the place of the part, what results is reflection of the same on itself with a privative determination. And the reason he gives is that everyone saying anything asserts that what they say is true. So if anyone says that what he's saying is false, he's asserting both that it's true and that it's false, and so he's implicitly asserting a contradiction. Now, you may recall that Bravadine, in a very similar move, infers that what was said is false, as is every contradictory utterance. But Burley, however, infers the conclusion above that uh, since you would otherwise run into contradiction here, uh, the part cannot, in this case, Supposit for the whole, it's a rule, whatever force a rule has here. And he goes on to illustrate this by looking at various examples. So Bravadine, in his criticism of Burley, focuses on what he calls the roots in its basic assumption. So why do people say this? We could concoct this reason, says Bravadine. If the part in such cases did suppose it for the whole of which it was part, it would follow that the same proposition was true and false, and that insolubles couldn't possibly be solved. But neither follows, as we will observe in what follows. So this is no more than a concoction of those who don't know how to respond otherwise to the insolubles. And then he goes on to give his own um, solution. And, many, and several other solutions too, of course. But in particular, he criticized restrictivism in, in Burley's form, I think, for giving no particular reason for singling out self-reference as a fatal flaw rather than some other mistake that's going on there. So uh, just to recall that you, you, you saw three of Bravadine's postulates yesterday. This, I just put this up largely as a contrast with the very minimal and vague way in which Burley uh, describes the uh, un underlying grounds for his own view. Bravadine sets his out much more systematically. Uh, and you've, you've, you've seen by, uh, bivalence, the closure postulate, and the claim uh, that restrictivism is wrong in the first three postulates. And then we've got a nice statement of, nice, very concise statement of De Morgan laws in P4, uh, disjunctive syllogism in P5, and the truth conditions for conjunctions and disjunctions in P6. Uh, a model of clarity, it seems to me. Okay, so there's the third and the second postulate, uh, behind which lies the fundamental idea in Bravadine that a proposition can mean more than at first appears. And as I've said over the last couple of days, I think that becomes the main battleground in debates for the rest of the 14th century. But in a way, it's not completely novel because we've just seen that Burley himself claimed that anyone saying anything implicitly asserts that what they say is true, an idea we can trace back at least to Bonaventure, and you'll, 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 we'll, we'll see in a moment, uh, pro, uh, arguably much further than that. Um, but Bravadine takes this idea a lot further than Burley does. Um, and I thought in, in, in modern parlance, you could say that Bravadine moves it from illocutionary force, namely a, a, an assertion, to locutionary meaning. They would say he's actually, the proposition actually signifies that uh, it's, it, that it's true, or at least it does in the case of insolubles. And then we find these proposals, as I've said over the last couple of days, in so many authors over the next uh, 80, 70 or 80 years.
Okay, so it's a little bit more on Burley before we before we come on to Seagrave. Um, it's surprising, in fact, how close Bravadin and Burley are in, in 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 the fossils that they agree on, and even more so with Seagrave. Um, but uh, interestingly, Burley Burley's idea is that every affirmative insoluble is false, and every ne negative insoluble is true. Whereas Bravadine is going to claim that every insoluble is false. Now, Burley doesn't spell out his account of truth and falsehood here in the insolubles, but he does describe it uh, at length in other works. Uh, Alessandro Conti, I quote here from his article on Burley in the Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, so, uh, assuring us that the three main principles of Burley's semantic theory remain the same throughout his career. And the third of those principles is that a proposition is true if and only if it's a sign of the truth of things. So in general, Burley's account is, is, is in that group uh, that takes truth to be adequation of thought and reality. Uh, he's a great, re a, a, a great realist and a, an increasingly more extreme realist throughout his career. So for him, true propositions, true uh, spoken, written, and mental propositions correspond to real propositions composed of the significance of their constituent terms, together with the copula of identity, identifying the predicate with the subject. And so they're true, if and only if the significance really are so related by identity. So to, the reason why Bravudin thinks that an example like I'm not speaking the truth is false, is that by his main conclusion, it also signifies that it's true. So things can't be whole as it signifies, so it's false. That's going over all ground. But for Burley, it's a bit different. And, and he spells it out at length. If anyone begins to speak like this, I'm not speaking the truth, then this is true. For truth in that utterance can't supposit for the whole of which it's a part because uh, we've got uh, purported self-reference in the context of a privative term like not and true. So it must supposit either for some other utterance of mine or for nothing. But there was no other utterance of mine, so truth here lacks a suppositor. Now, as a general rule, the medievals took existential import seriously, so affirmatives with empty terms are false, and so correspondingly, negative propositions with empty terms are true. And so we've got a negative proposition with an empty term. And so my utterance turns out to be true on uh, Burley's story. OK, so there's a bit of background in uh, Burley and Rabadine. Uh, Seagrave uh, is responding, or we'll, we'll see in many ways, to Rabadine and indeed shares many assumptions with Bravadine, including, uh, it seems, the second postulate, the famous closure postulate. Uh, so the next bit is, is, is to, to, to show for you a couple of places where uh, the obvious explanation of Seagrave's reasoning is that he's depending on and accepting Bravadine's closure postulate. So, the heart of Seagrave's solution is that whoever asserts a proposition asserts that it's true. And the restriction on supposition that Seagrave wants to go on and maintain to defend restrictivism is that the extremes of a proposition only suppose it for those things for which the whole can mean that it itself is true, assuming that it exists. And those extremes don't suppose it for such things for which the whole, assuming that it exists, would mean that it itself is false. This is my main point, he says. And the reason he gives is it's because the extremes take their supposition from the copula, whose significant is that the proposition is true, as was said. So the extreme doesn't suppose it for anything for which the whole would mean that it itself is false or not true, because this would be inconsistent with the significance of the copula. And so the extremes are restricted by the meaning of the copula. So let's look at an example, he says, uh, false and S, a, a, false, a falsehood exists, call it A. Uh, 
and suppose there's no other falsehood. And then he writes, but it's evident that this, a falsehood exists, doesn't signify that no other falsehood exists. But to take that on trust, he claims it's, it's evident, it's, it's manifest that that proposition doesn't signify that no other proposition exists. For it always signifies in one way for its own part, since it's not a conscious agent. Uh, but I think we're still puzzling exactly what he means by that. But on the contrary, this inference is necessary. A is false, therefore no other falsehood than A exists. Because if there were another falsehood, then A would be true. So whoever implies or signifies the premise signifies the conclusion. So from the opposite, that it doesn't signify the conclusion, it doesn't signify the premise. Now that argument only works if you actually adopt Bravardine's closure postulate in order to infer uh, from the signification of the premise to the signification of the conclusion. Uh, and then apply modus tollens to say, since it's evident to him that, that uh, a falsehood exists doesn't signify that no other falsehood exists, uh, then it clearly can't signify of itself that it's false. Now, in that particular context in Seagrave's treatise, it, one could plead in Seagrave's defense that he's actually in the middle of an ad hominem argument against Bravardine. So perhaps he's simply adopting Bravardine's postulate to show the absurdity or wrongness of Bravardine's position. Uh, but uh, what I want to go on and show is there's, a, there's another place a bit earlier on where he seems really to be speaking in proprio persona and still seems to be uh, applying Bravardine's uh, postulate. So here's this earlier passage. Uh, so, Seagrave bases the stronger claim, right, that um, no proposition can uh, signify itself in this sort of context by quoting Aristotle's remark from the metaphysics that the is in a statement also means that the statement is true and is not that it's not true. And then refers to the commentator, Averroes, in his comment where he says, being here signifies nothing but truth. And from that, Seagrave says he draws his only postulate. Here's the postulate that every proposition means things to be in reality as it signifies. This is self-evident and is clear from the philosopher and the commentator in comment 14 on the fifth book of the metaphysics and in the explanation of that comment as a whole. So the copula in the proposition signifies it to be a truth as, as elucidated there. From this, Seagrave says, my main claim follows demonstrably in this way. Every proposition not involving a contradiction signifies things being in reality as it signifies and doesn't signify they're not being in reality as it signifies. But things being in reality as the proposition signifies and not they're not being in reality as it signifies is for a proposition to be true and not false, provided the proposition exists. So for every proposition not involving a contradiction, assuming it exists, signifies itself to be true and not false. And he takes an example, suppose you're sitting, then it's being in reality is known to be as this signifies. You're sitting and it exists, so it follows that it's true and not false and so on. Therefore, every proposition not involving a contradiction assuming it exists, signifies itself to be true and not false. Now, uh, most of you will spot that that little clause in there, assuming it exists, is because of this medieval idea that propositions couldn't be true unless they existed, because they're concrete individual utterances. But what's striking to me about that passage is that generalizing from this example, you're sitting as an arbitrary example to uh, 
represent any proposition, he infers that any such non-contradictory proposition signifies itself to be true and not false. But he must clearly here be appealing to Bravadine's second postulate, that signification is closed under implication, because he's only he, because he's he's get, he's generated this from the implication that uh, it's true uh, and not false. Uh, that it, so if from any non-contradictory proposition it follows that it's true and not false, then that's part of what it signifies. So I'm 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 not going to fit at the end there, but I think I hope you got the idea. Is that in order to can get the, con the main claim, the conclusion that it signifies that it's true or not false, then he he's relying on the fact that any non-contradictory proposition implies that it's true or not false. Uh, and so uh, infers that that's part of what it means. Okay, so that's um, a place to slightly pause and take breath. So that's the background and the basic idea that Seagrave has got and, and, and what he bases it on. Now he wants to go on and uh, elaborate on that. And in particular, he's going to claim that uh, insolubles commit the fallacy of accident. Then the majority, I think I can say that, uh, uh, certainly very, very many uh, writers on insolubles at this time uh, blame it on the fallacy of the conditional or the, and the unconditional, or however you translate Simpliciter et secundum quid, and they uh, feel obliged to do so because they take it that that's what Aristotle did in chapter 24 of the De Sophistices Elenchis. Um, but uh, Seagrave says, no, that's not what Aristotle was doing in that chapter. Uh, uh, what actually is at fault in the insolubles is what. Um, Sorry, it's uh, De Sophisticates, sorry, the um, Secundum, Simplicity of Secundum Quid is chapter 25. And he wants to come to the previous chapter, which is chapter 24, and say that it's really what Aristotle was doing in chapter 24 on the fallacy of accident that describes the, the fallacy in insolubles. Now, if we go back to chapter 24 of the De Sophisticates Elenchis, we'll discover that the Main example there is a famous hidden man puzzle uh, using either the term your father or Cariscus, who presumably, uh, by presumption, is your, is your father. You know your father, you know, uh, sorry, your father is the man approaching, but you don't know the man approaching. Uh, Aristotle's diagnosis that one or more one or both of the two properties attached to Cariscus, on the one hand being known by you in the first premise and being the man approaching in the second premise is accidental or one might perhaps better say incidental to him. So there's no essential connection between the properties to support the necessity that Aristotle requires in moving from premises validly to the conclusion. That's, that's the standard story about what Aristotle was saying uh, about the fallacy of accident with the hidden man example. Now, uh, some of you, I hope, will agree with me that Aristotle's discussion of the fallacy of accident in that chapter is neither clear nor convincing. And in particular, what he says about examples like the hidden man appears to clash with what otherwise known as the principle of expository syllogism by the medievals or ecthesis by Aristotle, which Aristotle describes in chapter six of the sophistical refutations and arguably is what he's invoking in, in uh, chapter six of the prior analytics to give an alternative proof of Dirapti. Because he says about Dirapti, having proved it by reduction to the first figure, he says the demonstration can also be carried out uh, imperceivably, that is by indirect reduction, or by ecthesis, or what's sometimes called setting out. For, he says, if both terms belong to all S, and one chooses one of the S's, say N, then both P and R will belong to N, and so P will belong to some R. Uh, 
But the problem is, the problem is that you can put the hidden man in exactly that form, as I've done here, being known by you instead of Cariscus, being the man approaching instead of Cariscus, and so by uh, exesis, be, so being known by you instead of the man approaching. Uh, uh, so we can apparently, by this method, in, in validly infer the conclusion from the premises, despite the fact that intuitively the premises we thought were true and the conclusion false. Namely, you don't know the man approaching because he's in a mask or uh, too far away to recognize or whatever the reason is. So uh, a famous medieval attempt to clarify the fallacy of accident uh, to accord with Aristotle's theory of the syllogism uh, can be traced back to Giles of Rome. And Giles says that the fallacy arises when the fallacy of accident arises when there's variation in the supposition of the middle term. So here's a couple of quotations from Giles, that the major term, if it's true of the middle term, must then be true of the minor term, only happens in the case of those middle terms which are indifferent according to substance, because it requires the middle term not to vary or be diverse if the conclusion is to follow of necessity. And so he attempts to square this with what Aristotle says in the sophistical refutations. He said that it's not Aristotle's intention to deny that in no way are the unknown and the known the same. But he means that this fallacy is almost argued in four terms and always has a diversity of middle term. So he says that the same is not known and unknown because Cariscus is used in different ways and almost has the power of two terms as, he's, as Cariscus is placed with respect to knowledge and as he is approaching. And then Burley picks this up and extends the idea of variation of supposition from the middle to the extremes. So he says, in this fallacy, there should be assigned three, namely the attribute, the accident, and the subject thing. And according to Giles, the major extreme is always the attribute and the middle term, the subject thing, and the minor extreme, the accident. This is not a big worry, for it suffices for there to be this fallacy that some term is not included but is compared to two other terms in the argument. When it should be realized that the fallacy of accident sometimes results from a variation of the middle term, and sometimes from a variation of the major or minor extreme. But when still not home and dry, because Burley says um, we've got to identify the fallacy in the middle, in the hidden man puzzle. According to this fallacy, the paralogism is given in this way. One coming and one approaching is known by you. Cariscus is the one approaching, hence, etc. Or like this, Cariscus is known by you and is the one approaching, hence, etc. And it's usually said that it's a fallacy of accident from the variation of this term Cariscus. For concerning Cariscus, in that he's known by you, it's not included that he's the one approaching. But on the contrary, it seems that this is not a fallacy. For from the opposite of the consequent, we may, with the minor premise, infer syllogistically the opposite of the major premise. This is, this is the, uh, the method I mentioned yesterday, which always strikes me as being strange. Uh, that the media was very, uh, very, very keen, it seems, or, to uh, justify the validity of an argument by, by saying that, that it's contrapositive, or in this case, perhaps antilogism, one, one, one might say, or Aristotle's method of indirect reduction would be another way to describe it. Uh, the argument that results from contraposition in that way is valid. And of course, that just defers the problem. Uh, for he, for Burley says, this syllogism is correct. No one coming, no one approaching is known by you. Cariscus is the one approaching, hence, Cariscus, uh, the one approaching is known by you. So what's Burley's response to this? Uh, hopefully, we're going to get to a conclusion soon. Then it seems that in the first argument, there's no fallacy of accidents with respect to this conclusion, the one approaching is known by you. And Aristotle understood this, but it's a fallacy of accident in respect of the reduplicative conclusion, or in respect of this conclusion, the one approaching insofar as approaching is known by you. 
And then it's not a fallacy of accident from the variation of the middle term, but from the variation of the minor extreme, because this term, the one approaching, is taken in different ways in the minor premise and in the conclusion. Now, if you haven't come across it before, what the medieval was referred to by reduplication was uh, expressions like qua or insofar as. So we might say, I know Chris, Chris, Chris qua the one approaching. Uh, and they uh, spent a lot of time expounding reduplicative uh, propositions uh, in various ways. And indeed, they often use reduplication as a test for whether the fallacy of accident was present. So actually, actually Occam, who says that variation of the extreme is, is not the ground of the fallacy of accident, writes uh, at, at great length to disprove that. He does use the presence of reduplication as a mark of the existence of uh, it being a fallacy of accident. Okay, so um, what Seagrave has to do is spell all this out uh, and explain how it matches up with what Aristotle did. Um, so he considers the objection, the obvious objection, um, given the predominant, uh, the, do the dominant idea that it's the fallacy simpliciter, it's a cundum quid, which is how Aristotle uh, said we should solve insolubles. Finally, one can argue like this, if these parallelisms were to be solved by the fallacy of accident, then since it's not likely that they passed unnoticed by Aristotle, he would have solved such parallelisms where he does solve them by the fallacy of accident, where they think he solves them in chapter 25. And Seagrave responds to the final argument, I say that where Aristotle solves the paralogisms by the fallacy of accident, he shows how to solve paralogisms of this kind, that is, insolubles, because they have the same defect, as was proved before. For insolubles, the supposition of the middle or extreme term always varies. And this is to commit the fallacy of accident. Thus, these paralogisms are similar to insolubles, where the middle term being this something, the extremes are not connected. For one argues like this in insolubles, just as here, Cariscus is known by you, Cariscus is approaching, therefore the one approaching is known by you. If the term approaching is taken, or at least should be understood reduplicatively, and so the supposition of the extreme varies. Now, like the best uh, people writing about insolubles, Seagrave recognizes that he's not only got to uh, point out where the fallacy is in, uh, um, in, in insolubles. He's also got to explain why people are misled by them, why, why people make, make, uh, are tempted to commit these fallacies. Uh, and he follows, to begin with, quite a standard line, well, insolubles are so-called, he says, not because it's impossible to solve them, but because solving them is difficult. And in that he once again agrees with Bradbury. But he goes on to claim that insolubles are particularly difficult to solve since, quote, having filled in the middles in order to flash out the argument, they seem to differ in no way from good syllogisms. They have the same verbal disposition, both in mood and figure. For example, no falsehood is said by Socrates. This is a falsehood, so this is not said by Socrates. Therefore, because they have the greatest causes of their appearing to be good syllogisms, namely, the same as those of a good syllogism, they're the most difficult to solve. Hence, they're correctly called insolubles antinomastically through their argumentative strength. So, what's going on? Um, he then writes, insolubles commit the fallacy of accident because by arguing like this, this is said by Socrates, and this is a falsehood, so a falsehood is said by Socrates, the term falsehood supposes in the minor premise for something it doesn't supposit for in the conclusion. So the conclusion is the sophistical sentence Socrates says a falsehood, and the idea is that uh, by, by, by restrictivist ideas, falsehood can't supposit for the, conclu the conclusion, uh, but it does in the minor premise, uh, pointing to the conclusion because there's no self-reference. Similarly, in arguing like this, no falsehood is said by Socrates. This is a falsehood, so this is not said by Socrates. 
there's variation in the middle term because the term falsehood suffices for one thing in the major premise. Okay, it suffices for the conclusion. And another in the minor. Um, no, it can't. No, I've got that wrong. It supposes for what Socrates said in the minor premise, there's no self reference. It, can't suppose it for what Socrates said in the major premise, because the major premise is the contradictory of what, of, of what Socrates said. And propositions won't be contradictories if the supposition changes between them. In order to properly contradict something, you have to mean the same thing and deny it. And so you have to be referring to the same thing. Uh, so uh, falsehood can't suppose it for Socrates' statement in the major premise because that's the contradictory of Socrates thing. Because the term force is one thing in the major premise, something, something other than what Socrates said, and in an, and, and, and another in the minor, namely what Socrates said, according to those advocating this solution. And thus it's clear that they have to solve these kinds of problems according to the fact of accident, namely for a variation of the middle term or of an extreme term. And uh, we can conclude this by a brief discussion that Seagrave gives of supposition. As is standard practice, terms only have supposition in the context of a proposition, and they I can only suppose it for what they signify, but they don't usually suppose it for all their significance. For example, in a rational animal as a man, animal supposes only for men, not for all animals because its range of supposition is restricted by joining the expression rational. And moreover, uh, Seagrove says, the extremes of a proposition take their supposition from the copula. To suppose it for its supposits is to signify them to be the extremes of the union in reality, which the copula signifies. They do this sometimes conjunctively, sometimes disjunctively, according to the different mode of sub suppositing they receive from what signs are joined to them. So the, the ground I think has now been laid for Seagrave to proceed to solve the insolubles. Uh, and he does it by going through all the, all the many examples that Bravodin gives uh, as arguments against restrictionism to show that his version of restrictionism can solve them. So uh, I haven't got very long left. Uh, is about 10 minutes, Barbara? Or is that too much? No, it's, I think we should have 10 minutes, yeah. Um, it, will, it will be a bit of a rush, but what I wanted to do was at least show you Kilmington Sophism 48, which I think is fascinating Sophism in its own right. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in the fact that uh, mm -hmm. the same Sophism occurs in an additional chapter which is appended to Bravudin's Insolubles in two of the manuscripts and in Kilmington Sophismata as the final and devastating uh, sophism there and also is treated by Dumbleton uh, as, as, as one of the examples he feels he's got to deal with in responding to Bravudin. So here is how it occurs in Bravudin. Besides the Insolubles presented in the fourth chapter, which the solution of the restrictivist didn't solve, one insoluble was found which is forever incapable of solution in that way, laying down the gauntlet. For let A be one of God exists and nothing granted by Socrates is known by you, but you don't know whether A is the first or the second, and take B, A is known to you, where only B is granted by Socrates. Okay. This is, as I say, in a chapter which would appear to have been written later than um, Bravudin's Insolubles, but to my mind is, is by Bravudin, if not, it's not by Bravudin, it's by, it's by a supporter of Bravudin's. Um, uh, but we find that in Kilvington in a slightly, uh, in pretty much the same form, uh, slightly different letters. 
between these. And we find it also uh, in, in Seagrave. So here we find it in Seagrave, and there's just a couple of changes, uh, which are, well, one's minor and one needs to be corrected. Uh, one, one's in elision, I think. A paralysis may be made in another way like this. So a, B, one of these, God exists, and nothing proposed to Socrates is known by you, where it's unknown to you which of these is A. Let the proposition B, A is known by you, be proposed to Socrates, and nothing else, and ask about B whether it's true or false. So Seagrave's got proposed to Socrates, where the others have got granted by Socrates, but it seems to not matter, as I can see in the, in the logic of the argument, which you take, providing you're consistent about it. Um, the others say that only B is granted by Socrates, and uh, the, the puzzle's not going to work uh, unless we specify that, as I've done in the, in, the, in the angle brackets there, that nothing else is proposed to Socrates. I've added that in order to make the, the argument work. Uh, and what they're going to do is, very much in the, in the, in, in, in the language of, in, in sol uh, of obligations, they're going to show that B can't be denied, can't be doubted, and can't be granted. And that's a sophism, because of course you've got to one of those. You've got to either deny it, doubt it, or grant it. You've got to have a view. Uh, they actually follow a slightly different order in doing that. Uh, but that uh, in of, it, of some textual interest, but nothing to So I'm going to have to flip quickly through this because because the argument gets quite deep and embedded. Um, but uh, what I want to illustrate is we I think we can do it by the first one here. So. Sigurd wants to show that B can't be denied because the inference A is God exists, therefore A is known by you, is valid because God exists, is known by you because it's that universal knowledge that we all have. The premise is uncertain. You don't know whether A is God exists. Then the conclusion can't be denied. That's B. Uh, so B can't be denied. Now, that form of inference is, was christened by Kretzmann, Kilvington's disputational meta-argument, in his long discussion of, 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 of um, Kilvington's sophismata. Um, and it's used again and again by Kilvington. It's used here by um, Seagrave, and it's used in that uh, extra chapter by Brabody. And the idea presumably is that um, if an inference is known to be valid and you deny the conclusion, you're going to have to deny the premise. So you can't simply express doubt about the premises or even about one of the premises, providing you uh, grant the other premises. So again and again, they say, um, of, of by this particular meta-theoretical way of arguing. Uh, well, we're now going to have to go through similar reasoning to show that B can't be doubted. So it seems we've got to grant B because it can't be denied or doubted. Now, if we grant B, then Seagrave or the others say, uh, let's look at C, nothing proposed to Socrates is known by you, propose that. And then we first of all show that C can't be denied because of this argument. This is false and this is A, therefore A is false. If this refers both times to um, well, leave you to puzzle over it. Take it, take it slowly with a with a, a lot of coffee and you'll get there. Uh, so it can't be denied. Uh, but C can't be doubted. And finally, we discover that C can't be granted, but we've got to do one of them. So um, we, but if whatever we do, uh, we're doing, well, if we can't do any of them, then we better not grant B, because, we, uh, because if we do grant B, then we're in a contradiction. But we show we have to grant B, so that's the sophism. People can ask more about it in question time, perhaps. Um, so 
Uh, I then give a, a, my own brief summary of uh, what I think is really going on there. Kilvington has a solution to it, which I must admit I don't really understand, but I think that is what he says, pretty much. Uh, I'm not sure Kretzmann understands it either. Uh, there's Bravadine's solution of using Bravadine's principles. And finally, Seagrave does it by Seagrave's principles. Um, uh, well, in the middle of it, we came up with an inference that Bravadine calls E um, and Seagrave finds a problem with E, which uh, he thinks is solved by restrictivism, uh, uh, that by restrictivism shows that E is invalid. Um, and so we reject the validity of E, which was needed to show the contradiction in C. And so we've solved the problem. So he's vindicated restrictivism to the extent that it's managed to solve what Bravadine presumably thinks is the most devastating argument he's got against it. Uh, and so finally, by way of summary, there's a summary of uh, the basic ideas of Seagrave's insolubles, taking over ideas from Burley and Aristotle and Averroes, and uh, arguing that all insolubles uh, depend on a variation of supposition between the middle and the extremes, and so commit the fallacy of accident. I better stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. It was a very interesting talk, especially the last part on Kyobliton, I think, uh, has uh, created kind of brainstorm for people who have never, um, if people don't have read a Kyobliton text. Now the floor is open for question. Please put uh, your question or name in uh, the chat box so that uh, we can track the order of the queue. Okay, the first question is uh, from Miroslav. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, well, it's actually be kind of marginal. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I what slide, what which slide was it? Um, I don't know the number of the slide, but you mentioned the principle that uh, a term can only suppose it for what it signifies. Yes. Uh, what about material supposition? Does he, uh, as a matter of fact, claim that material supposition is significative? Because if it is, then there is a possibility of signifying itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I, I, I suppose, you know, to really answer that, from Seagrave's point of view, I'd have to check that. But uh, pretty much it's a distinction that a lot of them make between um, significative supposition and material supposition. So, uh, or personal supposition and material supposition. So uh, when a term is, su is suppositing in personal supposition, it can only supposit for what it signifies. Uh, when it, uh, when it, uh, it, it when it has material supposition, it's not, and there's a caveat to this, it's not for Occam and a number of others um, for what it signifies. Later in, in, later in the century, as you may or may not know, I, I wrote a paper about this some years ago, how is material supposition possible? Uh, later on, they go on to extend the notion of signification so that uh, terms have at least a twofold, if not a fourfold signification. So among its significance is itself. And so it's supposedly what it signifies in the material sense of, of signify when it has material supposition and in the personal sense of signify when it has personal supposition. But around this time, I would imagine that Seagrave is thinking very much in the Burley Occam terms where we're talking about uh, personal supposition. Uh, at, at this point. I want to take your point. Uh, it's, it, it, it's something we need to check. Manuel has a follow-up on 
dust. Thanks uh, for your paper. Very interesting. And uh, I, I, I have many questions, but in first time, uh, the postulate number two in Balguari then uh, talk about the interpretation is closed under implication. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what is the the nature the logical nature of the this implication don't look like a material implication is uh, appear very same to Gracian conditionals or or or, or what. Uh, you can clarify uh, uh, the idea for me, please? Yes, of course. Um, so what the Latin says is uh, that every proposition signifies uh, significat vel denotat, simpliciter vel ut nunc. Everything which follows from it, simpliciter or vel nunc. So you know, presumably there's a respectively in there, which, I, which, which, which I've added, all right? So um, he's covering both cases where we have uh, ab, uh, unqualified implication, uh, or uh, I suppose a lot of people might, call, might have called that natural implication, natural consequence, but also a non consequence, because you'll need a non consequence um, to uh, be involved when you have the um, contingent paradox. Right? Uh, you know, we need we need in order. You know, Socrates says Socrates says a falsehood. In order for that to be self-referential, we rely on the fact that that's the only thing that Socrates says. Uh, obviously, in the case where he says many other things, um, there's there's nothing necessarily self-referential about it. It. Uh, it could refer to his earlier utterance. But given the scenario where we specify that's the only thing Socrates says, uh, then um, it follows that it's self-referential. And then, depending on that contingent fact, I, as I call it, a matter of fact, or ut nunc, uh, Brabadine then infers that the proposition actually means or signifies its own falsehood. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, thank you. I mean, I mean just to follow up, I mean, it, it's interesting uh, I, as was brought home to me by a comment from a colleague the other day, that um, Bra Brabadine somehow makes this distinction between two sorts of signifying here. Uh, but actually, nothing much seems to depend upon it later on. Although he adds that phrase in there, uh, it, it, it doesn't play any significant role later on other than to allow him to uh, apply his main conclusion um, that... Uh, all insolubles signify of themselves that they're true and so are implicitly contradictory and so are false because things couldn't possibly be as they signify as a whole. But nothing seems much to turn on there being two sorts of signification other than the fact that he's got to include utnunk consequence in there in order to apply it to the, con the contingent insolubles. Uh, yes, I, I, pardon? Uh, uh, another question. The, the change in the supposition in the first premise and second premise, uh, 
in, yeah. in, con in contemporary terms. Uh, I, I, it's some type of quantifying change. The, the, the term uh, or uh, is, is, is logical determinate in, in quantifying terms or I, I have an intentional postulate is it, is is clarifying term extensionals or you believe uh, that I I I uh, need and, and postulate uh, for signification or intentional postulate. Right. Um, well, just we just just think basically about what the restrictivist is saying. They're they they're, they're presented with apparent sophisms in, in solubles in some form like uh, what I'm saying is false where someone uh, appears to be saying of their own utterance that it's false and a very natural thought about this is that there's something really odd about this and it can tie you in knots because you get the the flip-flop you know if it's true that it's false and it's false and it's true and there's something there's something dodgy going on uh, what's the obvious explanation of this is that there's self-reference in the context of these particular sorts of terms. You know, you're, 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 you're narrowing down the sort of symptoms of the disease. And then, they, you know, uh, the, even Burley does it a bit, but Seagrove does it in much more detail. You actually link this to some ideas you've got about how propositions get their meaning through the cop through the copula, which signifies a union of the subject and the predicate. Right? Uh, and so there's something implicit in a proposition about it being self, not self-verifying exactly, but self-asserting. You know, it's presenting itself as a truth. And that means that what I've said is implicitly contradictory. But it's not implicitly contradictory in the way Bravardine's done it by saying it actually means both if it's true and it's false, because if it meant that, um, you'd be going around uttering contradictions all the time. Um, they don't want to say that. They say, no, there's a rule that says that you're breaking some sort of convention of language. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm importing sort of modern terminology and ideas a bit into that. Uh, but you know, there's something breaking some sort of con conventions of language. Uh, or a rule, a regular, uh, which means that really you can't or you shouldn't do this. And so the term falsehood, uh, though it uh, in that context supposits for all other falsehoods, and although it actually signifies this falsehood itself, it can't supposit for this falsehood. Why can't it supposit for this falsehood? Or well, liken it to what happens when you stick. Um, what was it, uh, rational in front of animal? When you sit rational in front of animal, animal can't any longer supposit for animals because you get the wrong truth conditions. It only supposits for men at this point. Uh, and, and we explain why you know, a rational animal uh, is, is, is a man, turns out to be a truth. Whereas if animal supposited for donkeys in that context, and it asserted that donkeys were men, then it would be false. So there's a... a, a very natural idea here. Um, so I, but well, I haven't gone into the reasons why I think that it doesn't work. Um, but that's 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 another stage to come up with the arguments against it. I want for a moment to try and present it as um, oh, it's quite an interesting, well developed idea here. Does that help? I hope, I hope so. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but um, so, it's not the first time Sophism 48 has stunned an audience of mine into silence. Uh, so I, I commend, uh, you, you can read the story in the, um, in the handout. Um, and, and take a bit more time over it. It is a fascinating sophism and puzzling out the various solutions that these three authors give to you 
give 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 to it uh, is a very interesting intellectual exercise, actually. <laughs>